<clears throat> Hello everyone and welcome uh, to our event, which will start soon in two minutes. We're just waiting for everyone to gather in the Zoom and then we'll kick off with the agenda in uh, two minutes. Hi, everyone. Hello. Keep in mind that this event is recorded and it's also live streamed on uh, YouTube on the account of uh, a, uh, RDA Northwest. We are ready. You can start. So, hello everyone and welcome tonight to Research Valorization Demo Day. Uh, my name is Mircea Vadan and uh, tonight I'm going to be the host of this event, uh, which is uh, the closure of, uh, of a one year long program uh, focused on supporting research teams in various universities in the Northwest region with the aim to actually uh, develop uh, their projects and transform them into spin-offs, business related spin-offs in the process of technology transfer. So during the past several years, we've been uh, uh, several months, uh, the past year, we've been working together with the teams, supporting them in understanding the business environment in connecting them with uh, various stakeholders, depending on their uh, needs, and as well to, uh, uh, to craft the business model, to think about the strategy, about the partnerships, uh, and in any way possible. This project uh, is the second edition now, so it's Research Valorization 2.0, we call it, and um, was created uh, by... Uh, Regional uh, Development Agency Northwest and the World Bank. Um, and they are the crafters, the, the creators of the program. And we hope to find uh, tonight as well in the following months, a lot of synergies uh, in the program and support the teams further on. Uh, in this context, uh, we have an agenda that I'm gonna share with you in the next uh, minute. And then we uh, continue with our guest speakers. Yes, so you should see now the agenda of the event here on the screen. We have a couple of uh, opening remarks uh, with uh, Cristiano Gon, head of Smart Specialization Department at Northwest Regional Development Agency, and with Andrea Marucci, Marucci project manager of support, uh, supporting innovation in Romania and catching up regions from the World Bank. And then we're going to go on with the fireside chat with guest speakers Jan Proctor, Mark Crowell, and Mihai Lehene. And afterwards, we're going to have the long-awaited uh, teams presenting the projects. Each of them will have uh, five minutes of presentation. And uh, afterwards, uh, we're going to get uh, two minutes of questions from the panelists that I will mention a little bit later. And then we'll have uh, conclusions from uh, Cristiano Gon again. Afterwards, uh, we will have one more hour of uh, talks in breakout room uh, uh, rooms where you actually can uh, talk directly with the teams if you want of course that's an optional part the ones of you who are interested to talk with the teams they can stay later on each of the teams will have a breakout room uh, and we'll be going there to address questions or to understand details maybe discuss partnerships depending on what you feel like uh, is best uh, for you you will see the list of teams, you'll be aware about what they do, and you can choose to whom you want to talk. It's going to be a group discussion, the team members on one side and uh, several participants probably on the other side. So we let it like a free discussion, half an hour with one team, 25 minutes, half an hour with one team, and then uh, uh, the last half an hour with another team. And of course, if you need connections and if you want to develop a connection or uh, discuss various details with uh, some other teams, we can always do a follow up by email. This being said, uh, I'm currently inviting Christian Otcon from uh, uh, RDA Northwest to address a few words on behalf of the agency. Thank you, Mircea. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, I'm glad to have you all on board uh, in this afternoon together with us uh, in uh, this uh, additional step that we are taking today. Uh, in it, when, when we are talking about uh, the RVP initiative, uh, Mircea said that uh, we are the second edition. And uh, as a general remark, uh, we took a step further on uh, with this uh, demo day that we have today because for the first edition, we didn't have this demo day. And it's important to know that uh, this whole initiative is a pilot one. We try to learn along the way. We try to create uh, something that uh, is useful in our ecosystem uh, and uh, something that could be uh, suited uh, on the needs uh, of research teams, on the universities as institutions that want to address better uh, go-to-market innovation. And uh, this is something that is uh, uh, improvable, something that uh, together with you can be, uh, uh, can be taken a step further on for the next editions that we propose to have. So first of all, I would like to thank the universities that uh, were being open uh, for this involvement uh, in our initiative uh, and promoted the, the, the call inside the, uh, the research teams. Also, I would like to thank all the experts, uh, the ones from the World Bank, uh, and uh, also all the others that are together with us today in our uh, demo day uh, that we, we are um, participating in. And um, it's important to know that um, uh, their involvement uh, and their support uh, for the assistance and guidance uh, to the researchers uh, from our region and from the Northeast region that was also involved uh, in this uh, joint initiative uh, was something that um, uh, uh, we are not always being familiar with uh, as uh, regional development agency. So we are used to this uh, administrative uh, uh, framework in which we just uh, do um, analysis on papers and uh, we don't take face-to-face -face dialogue and we don't uh, do this uh, proactive discussions uh, in our ecosystem but uh, hopefully we will learn from this experience and uh, we will be able to uh, create better versions of uh, this uh, demo day and uh, the whole RVP initiative. And also we propose that in our smart specialization uh, strategy, in our entrepreneurial discovery process, we, we can uh, create better interaction in our ecosystem uh, to, to have this uh, exchange of experience and uh, guidance uh, for uh, better, uh, better support of innovation and uh, better uh, a, a, a feeling of uh, closeness uh, in our ecosystem. None the least, uh, I want to cr congratulate all the teams uh, for being proactive, uh, for hopping on board with us on this journey. And uh, it's important to know that uh, we are not necessarily uh, the, um, the coordinators of this initiative, the coordinators were uh, the representatives from the World Bank. We were also learning along the way as RDA, uh, together with my colleagues that were involved. Uh, and uh, we were also uh, in this stage of um, taking notes and uh, wanting to improve ourselves as the teams uh, wanted uh, in, this, uh, in this journey. So uh, I will leave the, the conclusions for the last part of our meeting. Uh, and uh, I think I can give the floor to Andrea, which is representing today the World Bank. And uh, I want to thank her for uh, being together with us and supporting us in this, uh, in this journey. Thank you, Christian. It's such a pleasure to be here. And uh, actually, I will keep it short because I'm so much looking forward to hearing from the teams and the panelists. And uh, I mean, this is uh, this, let's say, second round of RVP has been conducted almost entirely virtually on our side. So, and I think uh, in general, and I, I, I believe that this is a practical, you know, outcome of this, which we're all looking forward to. So just to say, uh, the first thing I wanted to say is really thank the RDA and RDA, the two RDAs we've been working in, uh, with uh, in this broader program that you mentioned. 
And, you know, these things take time, you know, developing a, an innovation ecosystem is not something you can do overnight, but we have really seen a change in these past years. One of them, one of the main ones uh, is on the RDAs and how you guys have developed and how you embraced this role. And, you know, we believe, I mean, we always uh, have seen you as a key uh, stakeholder in, in, in this project, and that has been one of the most encouraging results. Um, so, as I said, this is part of a broader program. And uh, uh, let's say a key focus of the program is definitely increasing the interactions between uh, the universities and industry players, as well as public-private research collaboration. So uh, the RVP is one of one of the key components. Uh, in addition to that, we also worked on other aspects uh, uh, in this pilot program. One of them was supporting uh, several labs in the regions uh, uh, to sort of increase the try and see how they can increase the volume of their commercial contracts with companies. We also worked on identifying some of the key challenges uh, um, on the road to developing this innovation ecosystem. And maybe I just wanted to mention very br briefly two of the key challenges that we believe need to be addressed going forward. Uh, one of them is definitely the, the funding uh, and uh, do, is there adequate funding for a particular early stage innovation? How can this be improved? What are the core issues? And uh, we believe going forward, that's one of the topics that really needs to be, uh, you know, we need to see how to strengthen that aspect. And the second one is also on the, uh, framework, the legal framework in particular, and the related uncertainties. Uh, part of this program was um, on ident identified that as a key challenge as well, and we produced uh, a review of the intellectual property regulatory landscape and you know what can be improved uh, in that respect. Uh, um, as well as uh, the aspect of state aid and a methodology on how to uh, register, monitor, and report economic activity. We have seen there is a lot of uncertainty in that area. Um, those are some of the, let's say, activities in this pilot program that we believe need to be disseminated more broadly, in particular at the national level, uh, because while our collaboration at the regional level has been excellent, unfortunately, we have seen very little movement at the national level in tackling some of these key challenges. We will present uh, some of these broader findings and lessons learned uh, in April um, in an event we're going to be organizing together with you guys. Uh, um, uh, we will share more information on that and we hope you can all join and that we can start really disseminating this good work beyond the two regions uh, across Romania. Um, just in conclusion, the, the, the teams uh, in the pilots, both RVP1 and 2, really demonstrated that there is a strong pool of teams that work on technologies and that have commercialization potential. So, you know, really congratulations everyone on this second round and looking forward to continuing and really hearing from the teams. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Christy, and uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, just to add on top of that, uh, I'm really excited to be part of this project because I think I've noticed what happened in the past two years in this project in other areas of tech transfer in Romania. And I think there's so much potential that we're under uh, underutilizing. So I think we can do much more. And uh, I feel we're kind of at the start of a movement which can grow and have quite a strong impact in the innovation ecosystem and both in the, uh, in the business environment in Romania, hopefully especially that we have a lot of things to catch up on this area. Uh, this being said, uh, we move on to the to the next 20 minutes uh, for the fireside chat with a couple of my guests, which I got to know in the past uh, several months. Um, and I'm going to invite here on the stage uh, uh, my guest speakers, uh, and I will address a few questions to them. Jan Proctor, innovation expert, uh, and Mark Crowell, innovation expert as well at World Bank. Uh, Jan comes with a British background, while Mark comes with a US background. And Mihai Lehene, president and founding member of uh, Romanian United Fund. Uh, he's now in Europe, but he's usually based in the uh, US. So, uh, welcome to all three of you. I'm really happy to have you here. And uh, I'm just going to dive specifically in the questions, and I'll ask you each one of you to reply one by one. Uh, and the first question that I want to ask you is, uh, how does the research and tech transfer in Romania seems from the outside, from your angle? 
this is like a warm up question and then we're going to dive in into something more practical about uh, what we can do and act in order to improve the ecosystem. So I think, uh, Ian, you have the floor. Okay, well, th thanks, Merchant, and good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, so I I've spent a fair bit of time in different innovation ecosystems, different um, countries uh, across the world. And what, I'm see what I've seen in Romania for the past three, four years is it is nothing too different, really. I think it's just getting started. There's lots of good teams. There's lots of good research going on. Um, we just need to develop some of the some of the building blocks to enable the the ecosystem to flourish. Um, work, working with the teams has been has been great. They're, they've been energized. They've been um, enthusiastic, um, passionate, but also experts in in, in what they what they do. Um, we, we've been able to progress a number of technologies from concepts, um, lab bench ideas towards um, what you will see later in the presentation. So I, I don't think there's anything different about um, the, the landscape there. I think it just needs to be exploited uh, for, for want of a better term. And um, it just needs investment, both financially, resources, but, but also in, in, in human capital and capability to, to take early stage technology to market. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Mark? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, pleased to join you uh, this morning for me, this afternoon for you um, um, in my, in my uh, office in Research Triangle Park. North Carolina, uh, quite a quite a robust technology transfer and innovation ecosystem, and um, I'm pleased to say that I see lots and lots of characteristics of your emerging ecosystem that align with what I've seen develop here over the course of my career. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to recognize and thank Christy and his colleagues at the RDA. I think I'll echo what Mercha and Andrea and others have already said that that one of the real great things about this project, particularly RBP2, where we've seen really a, a higher level of, of engagement and, and embracing, if you will, of this innovation program by the RDA colleagues. And I think it sets the stage for continued growth and evolution of the ecosystem uh, in Romania writ large. So it's been a real pleasure to work with them. A great pleasure to work with my World Bank colleagues, of course, but, but really a pleasure to work with, with the innovator community. Uh, represented on this call and throughout these projects. With respect to what I see in Romania um, <clears throat> in the way of research and tech transfer capacity, um, the research that I see is, is, is absolutely on a par with what I've seen in other parts of the world where I've worked. I've been in a number of different regions of the US uh, and the Middle East, and I've done other work in Europe, um, particularly Eastern Europe. And uh, there's no, question in my mind that the quality and the focus and the capacities represented in your science, in your R&D community um, is is as good as, better than, yeah, I'm not gonna say good as, better than, not quite as good as, it's, it's, it's on a par with. And I've been very encouraged by the quality of the ideas and the quality of the people that are developing those ideas. I think uh, what I've seen among the teams that are participating in RBP which I think is critical for developing the ecosystem further is I'll call it the capacity for connecting, networking, and being coached. The coachability of entrepreneurs is a critical factor, in my opinion. Your openness to input, your willingness to listen to it, to process it, to fight back where it doesn't apply, to adapt it and uh, to adapt to it and incorporate it in your effort where it does apply has been maybe better than I've seen other places. I've found that uh, Many of you have engaged in the coaching sessions uh, more openly and more robustly than I've seen in other places where there might be, uh, you know, whether it's communication issues or social mores or cultural issues that make it harder or uh, to, 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 to break through with the kind of advising that's been done to help help you all look at your science, not just for its science, but, also, but for its application in the commercial setting. So uh, I, I, 
I've observed that. I can't tell you why I think it's the way it is, but I think it's an asset to be exploited. Um, and I think it's very, very exciting. I think in terms of continuing to exploit the, and build out the ecosystem, uh, I do think our TTO colleagues have been engaged and, and open. Um, I, I think it's, it is a manpower issue. It's, it's a, um, it, 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 there's a capacity that still needs more investment and more focus in your individual institutions. I would encourage researchers to work within your institutions and in any venues that you can to encourage stakeholders and decision makers to continue to invest in and underscore the importance of creating a robust tech transfer capacity at each institution to support your efforts as innovators to partner with the RDA going forward to ensure that the momentum and the capabilities that have been uh, uh, developed and catalyzed during this project uh, continue. And then I think the last thing I'll say is, is that's needed to, to, to maybe focus on a little bit more is industry engagement uh, that you as TTOs need to engage regularly with a net, regular network of industry contacts to understand what they're looking for, how they like to do business, what's the best way to approach them with a technology licensing or an IP opportunity. Uh, and when I say industry, I mean either existing companies or I mean entrepreneurs and investors who might want to start new companies. So it's critical that they continue to build out those networks and engage with them on a regular basis so that there's more of a, a matching and understanding, if you will, of interests that the industry contacts may have and the capabilities that the university contacts may have. Um, so I think industry engagement, uh, uh, expansion of your TTO capacity at each institution, continued work by you, the innovator community, by the RDAs and others, uh, you've you've got a lot of momentum going, and I'm excited to see how this how this continues to build out. I'm excited to be with you today. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, somehow you answered my uh, next question as well. So I think I'm going to blend a little bit the topics here. So Mihai, uh, I remember two months ago we had a call about uh, universities and uh, innovation and how things are happening in US. How they're happening in Romania. You kind of know both like a system. And I'm curious uh, on one side uh, to hear from you, how does it seem from the outside uh, in comparison? Or it's going to be a kind of uh, <laughs> wide comparison. How, how does it seem for you the technology transfer ecosystem in Romania on one side? And uh, to continue with the question that uh, Mark answered partially, what do you think we should do as ecosystem actors in order to encourage this development? How can uh, we how how can technology transfer offices can be improving their impact and support? So I kind of blended two questions in one, but I know you can handle it. <laughs> um, I unmuted myself, uh, Mitya. Thank you very much. Um, I I wanted to say. I'm super thankful to be here and super appreciative of what you do. I think uh, to a large extent, you're doing exactly what needs to be done. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to see that this is happening. And I just want to encourage this kind of project. And I want to encourage you to continue as much as possible in this direction because you're doing the right thing. Um, this being said, I come uh, to the table today as a, sort of like a I would call myself uh, an industry player. I'm, um, I, I was in the finance industry for several years in Chicago, and I started my own uh, family office uh, about six years ago. I've invested in several companies in the United States. Um, and after, you know, very recently only, I started investing in companies in Romania. I started to look at startups in Romania. So I'm a little bit familiar with the startup ecosystem, and I'm very passionate about um, affecting change creating impact. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about the long term and about the ecosystem. And I've learned as much as I could about you know, other, other nations and how they do things. So um, I've never been, you know, sort of on your side. I, this is the first time I'm at this type, you know, in this type of panel. I don't know a lot about what you guys do, but I have sort of the industry, you know, sort of experience. And with all due respect to um, Yan and Mark, uh, I would like to disagree today. Um, I'm going to allow myself to be the bad wolf. I, um, I, I think when I came to Romania, I, in my initial, you know, I just want to give you a little bit of 
experience there. My initial reaction was like, wow, this is amazing. Romania has progressed so much. So I need to preface, you know, what I'm going to say by saying that I was pleasantly surprised to see that there's pockets that are moving fast and they're, they're efficient. And, you know, they seem to work very much like, you know, what you would expect in the West. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at the global, at the global, at the broader picture, I think the, the reality is actually uh, quite different. And, and um, I think there's, there's a lot to do. And I think Andrea mentioned it before. She said, well, we work very well at the regional level. And I think I've seen the same, you know, sort of, um, you know, I, I've, you can make, there's a distinctive, um, I, I think the university in Cluj and what you're doing with your group is, has got like a very, it's very advanced in trying to do this kind of like outreach. But um, in order to, in order to exemplify what happens in general, I'm going to give you a little story that comes from a friend of mine. Um, he's got a very successful company. He works only with top engineers around the world. And um, he hired several people in Romania um, that are basically, they were top technologists and they're coming out of a top university in Romania. And in his words, um, he said, it is unbelievable how little they know about real life applications. And that it took them two years to realize that the projects that they were working on are not homework, <laughs> homework assignments for school. And, um, and, and in, in general, their engagement with the customer is zero. And they spend a lot of time working on issues that are, you know, sort of like not asking questions and, and not working with the customer or with the team. So they were very difficult to integrate. And I think, you know, this, this sort of shows that to some extent, our universities today still produce um, a lot of people that are not prepared for the real world. And it's amazing that what you see is, and, and here I, I definitely do agree with, um, with Mark. Um, Mark, uh, previously you said that Romanians are very coachable and I think, and, and very enthusiastic. And I've heard these words and I couldn't agree more. And I think the people that are willing to sort of step out of their comfort zone um, and yep. then sort of, you know, learn from others and they, they get in contact with others, they learn very fast because they approach it, they know that there's a lot of things that they don't know. So they really approach the table with a very open mindset and they, they're you know, enthused to work with people that are professionals and they acquire their skills quite fast and they're very open to suggestions. So I think there's a lot of good things about it, and I, but I also think that there's a lot of work. Um, so this was my answer to your first question, which is how does research and tech transfer, you know, sort of seem from, uh, from the outside? Uh, Mihail, let me stop at you a bit, sorry. It seems someone of the admins uh, started the share screen and I can really ask them to stop the share screen. I think it's a video or Christy. We are trying to solve the problem now. Yes, so this will be taken care of. Uh, I'm not sure who is uh, sharing the screen from the administrators and I cannot stop ah. it. Thank you. So, Mihai, please do go on. And also, I want to point out a little bit to, to go towards uh, what can we do as an ecosystem, which I think is uh, one of the important things we can take uh, as takeaway for this event. Thank you. So, um... Again, this is after talking to several people and consulting myself with other people, trying to figure out, okay, well, what would be something that we can actually do? Um, and I think, I think what needs to be done is to encourage companies to work closer with universities. Um, to a large extent, um, the, the sort of the uh, private sector and the universities today in Romania, they, they, there's very little interaction between the two. Um, so creating grants where that are dedicated, you know, to be used sort of in tandem by both part by both sides, um, and you know maybe maybe you allow companies to deduct any sort of funding that they work on a project with a university. Maybe you allow it to deduct it from taxes. So I'm looking at systems like legal ways that you can offer incentives for the private sector to work with universities. I think that's, that's one thing that I would underline. Um, and, and they have to, they have to be solid partnerships. I think to a large extent, what we've seen in Romania is um, we've seen that 
In general, when there's an outside partner like a multinational or a foreign uh, party, uh, the you know the people that are coming to the table they're approaching it in a much more serious fashion. So I highly recommend. And there's a lot of uh, um, te well technology transfer. I guess that's what we're talking about. There's a lot of in, it, there's a transfer in knowledge between the foreign partners. So um, encouraging this as well as encouraging you know any sort of foreign foreign investment. Um, and last but not least, I think in the United States, there's a good system where students, they really have to go through these internships and they have to prove themselves. And I think that's also on, an underutilized uh, sort of, you know, principle in Romania. Um, I, I think there's a tendency to look at internships kind of, you know, well, it's just something I need to check off rather than um, sort of a springboard for, for me to learn. I mean, just. I mean, a springboard for me to get into the workforce, and also a way for me to learn new tech, new, new new technologies and new new skills. So, um, anything that you can do to encourage these things, working between the private sector and the, the the university sector, and encouraging students to to get internships, like real internships, um, I think those are the two things that I'd stress and you know encourage. I think, I think just Thank to highlight Mihai. some of the outputs from, uh, from RVP1 were, ex were exactly what Mihai touched on, was actually getting some of the teams ready for um, that industry engagement, um, to, to, to be able to talk in the right way, on the right level, about the right things. And as you say, to make it sustainable and, and, and valuable as a partnership. And, and I think that's what we've we've seen some of the teams move towards, this awareness that, Yes, they do need to speak to industry partners. They do need to be influenced by market needs and, and, and market requirements, market challenges. Um, so I think I think providing that interface and as, as, as Mark touched upon, the, the the capacity building exercise for technology transfer people to to create that interface, to create those collisions between you know academia and industry on a on a continued basis. And um, I, I think. Obviously, our focus today is or has been coaching university teams to work with industry. I would suggest there also needs to be a mechanism for, for, for industry to be coached or, or, or engaged um, with, with university and, and, and academic research as well. So it's, it's a two way thing, not just a not just a one way thing. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Uh, anyway, I wanted to pass the word uh, to you before moving to a conclusion with uh, uh, all of you once more. So if you have any other things to mention, Ian and Mark, uh, now would be the moment, then I'm going to ask the final question. No, I guess it's just one other concept I would I would insert. I, I think, again, behind Ian each touched on it, but maybe I'll call it, call it out specifically and that is and it's something that i've mentioned almost every time i've been in romania since march of 19 and every every zoom call about this project is one of the things we're also talking about is enhancing increasing building up transaction capacity okay so you could have you have great research um let's say we build up you know an ip portfolio around it we develop a, a business plan a business model canvas around it at the end of the day uh uh there has to be an ability for a company or an investor, a partner, uh, to acquire those rights that, to the extent necessary to commercial to, to, to develop a commercial product or service around that development. And so, I think that takes uh, all the players in the ecosystem, from the TTO to the university rector to the researcher or innovator, to the company business development people, company management, investors, etc., understanding. You know, what does a deal look like? What does a good deal look like? How should we approach negotiation processes? Um, how do we make sure that our transaction times are streamlined to the point that they can be? We all hear the phrase in industry, time equals money. Uh, a lot of universities don't, un I'm a university creature. I would be the first to admit uh, we don't always operate that way. And I understand why our industry colleagues sometimes think we don't get them and we're not responsive to them in the same sort of a sense of urgency and time about you know, sort of an opportunity cost uh, uh, 
concern that they have when they come into a discussion. So I think as we as we think about building out the ecosystem, I think it's building transaction capacities, partnerships, resources of various types to be sure that uh, the assets, the projects you're working on progress along a path that's a, a reasonable path from lab to market um, and, and that we have the ability at each step of the way to ensure that value is being captured and presented or packaged in a way that industry can take take the handoff and actually go to market. Thank you, Mark. Uh, maybe a last word uh, or message to the audience from Mihai and uh, Ian before I, taking off to the team presentations. I do have one last thing that I wanted to say, but I want to yes. give you know, you know, the chance to speak it just in case there's a limited time. Sorry. I think, I think yeah, probably the final, final comment for me would be, um, you, you know, things are happening. Momentum is, is being generated. Um, probably just to, to continue with that really and, uh, and keep things going more, more of the same. Um, but as we, as we're learning from these pilots to obviously improve things, scale things up, um, And, and create more collisions, more discussions, and more opportunities. Mitcha, thank you very much, Ian. Mitcha, I'd like to add one last thing here. Um, so I think establishing um, some sort of a office where an external investor or an external party can come to and say, hey, I'm going to need your support to navigate the local system and create a contract. Because I think this is, it all translates into, okay, we're going to work together type of thing. Um, I am fully aware of two extremely serious uh, tries by one, um, a university in Illinois, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology. They try to create a joint venture with their university in Romania. And two, a research company that had a grant of at least 100,000, between 100,000 and a million dollars. And they went to a, a university in Romania and it turned out that there's a certain way things are done in universities in the West where, you know, the private party goes to the university. There's something called um, statement of research. It's kind of a contract where, you know, both, both organizations sign that contract. And this is done so that if any one of the parties does anything stupid with the particular research, you know, the other side is protected. So it's a liability um, a document. It's a legal document, right? And this is one of the, one of the largest and major universities in Romania, um, according to their statement, they had never had, they had never received such a grant. They were not ready to sign the contract. They asked for a 30% overhead without providing anything, without be willing to provide anything instead. Um, and the, the particular party walked away. So in, in the case of IIT, it took, so in the case of IIT, It took two years of discussions before the Americans decided that the Romanian university is not serious and they're not going to enter into a contract and everything's, everything went away. And as you know, personally, um, I came to fully aware of these initiatives. I came to Romania and I said, I'm going to start talking to different university uh, leaders. And, but also in my due diligence process, I started asking around about how these universities are being run. And, and what I hear is that the, the, the current universities and the current university system is very satisfied with the status quo. There's zero competition between the universities, you know, and they feel like we're, everything that we're doing is perfectly fine. So they do not in general approach uh, this process with an open mindset, one where they need to grow and they need to keep in sort of, you know, they keep, they need to keep learning. And, and, and I do not want to generalize. I mean, well, I do want, I want, I want to say that this is in general, right? So I don't want to talk about any single university. And I, I agree that there will be exceptions. And I think that what we need to do is we need to focus on these exceptions, um, you know, on those particular universities that are willing to, you know, sort of step out of their comfort zone, work with them in particular in order to create the blueprint that can then be shared so that we can work with university in, is in general. So I think the, the legal and the contractual, you know, sort of format, the 
you know, these steps, you know, have, they have never been walked before. So they're scary for the party, the particular parties in Romania. And I just want to say that I'm, you know, I, I would like to support the process as much as I can, but it's also, you know, until these problems are solved, it's kind of hard for the industry to, you know, be willing to put any sort of legwork into it because it just seems like it's too difficult. So it needs to be, we need to make it easy for the industry and especially for the diaspora industry and for the diaspora professionals to get involved in the process. Thank you, Mihai, for your message. Uh, definitely, there is a long way to walk, and uh, it's. Uh, I think it's a long-term game that we have to play here, and things will not shift uh, overnight or over like one year. And that's why I believe many of us here they see the value in this, and we know where we start from and uh, where we can get. But uh, I think the difference is measured in uh, maybe like uh, five years steps. Not like in the startup ecosystem, maybe a year or two, as uh, we use the speed. But uh, nevertheless, uh, yeah, I'm very optimistic, as I usually am, about what can happen in the future. And uh, we being the, or not only we, because it, it can be many other organizations or uh, people who uh, it will hopefully will be able to facilitate the exchange of information. Because I think these two different languages and mindsets and bridge together, they can actually uh speed up the process much faster uh so i'm really grateful for Ian, mark and uh, mihai i see here on a diagonal <laughs> and uh, uh i also think this event is about sharing contacts so please provide your uh, linkedin profiles if you want also email addresses of people participants can reach out to you as well and even the participants feel free to share your linkedin profiles i think it's always amazing that we can connect in events like this uh, even if we're like on uh, three continents now so feel free to connect with each other here in the chat and meanwhile i'm going to invite the first team presenting uh, which is uh, excellent uh Ede, we have uh, five minutes of presentation for each of the teams and then we have a panel of uh, uh experts uh, presenting uh, asking questions. So two questions for each team. We're a little bit li limited of time for the question area, but we can go in depth in the Zoom breakout rooms in the end. I just want to read the list of, uh, yeah, Ed shared the screen, but I just want to read the guests who will address questions. So it's going to be Jonas Monteano from Bosch, uh, Georgiana Ion uh, from Impact Hub, Danka Luperiano from Early Game Ventures, Mihai Lehene from Romanian United Fund, Ion Petrovai from Fresh Blood, Maton uh, Metesky from uh, Flashpoint, Mihai Sintescu from Abilito Capital, Maris Mitroy from UFGD, and Jan uh, Proctor from Wallback. So, and Mark as well, uh, that you met earlier from the World Bank. So, uh, anytime uh, you want to address a question in the end of the presentation, drop me a message uh, or you can write the question in the chat and we can take the first two questions. And if there are more, there is more feedback and more questions, we definitely have the space for each of the teams in the Zoom breakout rooms uh, in the end of the event. So, that being said, uh, please, uh, please start with it. Okay, <clears throat> hello everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, all good. Okay, Go great. So I would like to tell uh, you a few words about our uh, solution proposed Exalute for the non-invasive treatment of age-related degenerative eye diseases. Humans in most mother cultures hold their eyesight uh, above all other senses. All interactions throughout our lives rely some way on it, rarely giving it much thought. But what if we end up losing our sense of vision? The chance of this to happen is continuously rising as life expectancy is on an increasing trend and our eyes uh, exposure to aggression factors is also extended. The magnitude of populational aging is impressive, where by 2060, people over 65 years of age is forecasted to reach nearly one fifth of the global population. The human eye is constantly exposed to the negative impact of various forms of natural or artificial light, which doubled by the process of aging, eventually overpowers the eye's inherent defense mechanisms in swiftly fighting against this photooxidative stress, leading to various age-related degenerative eye diseases, simply called ARIDs. These eye conditions imply severe visual impairment up to progressive and irreversible blindness. Above 50 years of age, the risk of developing these eye diseases severely rises. 
Nevertheless, the number of people potentially benefiting from the aid of therapeutic or prophylactic tool may be much larger. Unfortunately, some of these eye conditions currently lack efficient therapy or are relying exclusively on invasive surgery. Early stages of these diseases can be screened by periodic eye checks. Thus, the ophthalmologist may further plan and supervise the therapeutic approach and its progress. Furthermore, various signs of vision impairment may trigger individuals to seek for a remedy. The market potential of a product intended for the treatment of these eye conditions is significant, simply by considering the number of individuals suffering from these invalidating eye diseases. As the dietary on oral therapeutic supplementation is ineffective in restoring the depleted levels of the naturally occurring antioxidants in the eye, an alternate solution has been sought for. What we offer is an innovative lutein-based drug delivery system formulated as simple to apply eye drops, which are able to efficiently restore the ocular levels of lutein and having the ability of non-invasively prevent the progression of these degenerative diseases, such as cataract or macular degeneration. Our product is very well positioned, representing a non-invasive, simple to use and efficient therapeutic tool, implying low risks and costs in comparison with the more invasive or the reference surgical approaches. As cataract is affecting a significant number of adult dogs, the product can be marketed both for human and veterinary use. To ease on the regulatory hurdles, and considering that none of the product ingredients raise safety issues, the product may be registered as a medical device within the class of non-prescription or OTC drugs. Depending on the type of customer, such as individual patients, eye specialists, or various healthcare providers, uh, <clears throat> three types of pricing models are envisaged, namely, namely retail, treatment, or a wholesale plan. As means of reaching the market, either licensing the technology or directly manufacture the product through a tier one supplier may be considered. The current status of the developed product in terms of technological and market readiness is in a quite advanced state, the IP being secured through an international patent. As a stepping stone towards human therapeutic use, we are in a preparatory phase of a clinical trial on dogs with cataract. A multidisciplinary team of pharmacists and medical doctors from Yulia Hatsigano University, along with joint expertise from Louisiana State University, US, is pushing the technology forward, covering all relevant fields in product development. A strong support in identifying the clinical and market needs of these degenerative eye conditions is offered by an ophthalmology clinic, as well as for the veterinary market preparation, several veterinary clinics have joined for our support. As part of our immediate needs, we would like to raise awareness on the prospects of efficient and non-invasive prevention and treatment of these eye diseases. We would welcome investments, sponsorships, or funding for speeding up the process of reaching the market. Furthermore, we are seeking support in business, sales, and regulatory issues, as well as aid in identifying strategic partners. One year from now, we aim to finalize the mentioned clinical trial on dogs which could represent a solid milestone for a successful entry on the veterinary market. With all that being said, I would kindly invite you to join in helping our vision safeguarding your vision. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Ada. So now we have uh, two minutes for questions, hopefully two questions, and we can take uh, any of the questions. Uh, from the panel list. I'm just gonna, you can just announce yourself in the chat here, or you can raise your hand here in Zoom and I will see you. And you have the word, so you can start asking directly. Done, please. I think you raised uh, your how, hand. How much, how much money do you want to raise right now in order to, to uh, obtain the, the, the first milestone? Yes, this is a good question. Well, this will depend on the number of uh, dogs we will able to, to include in our pro uh, project in, the, in this clinical study. Unfortunately, we do not have an exact number of dogs. Therefore, I cannot tell you a precise number because this will be strongly dependent on the, on the number of animals. But uh, this is at the beginning. So unfortunately- You can make an estimation of range, not necessarily 
Well, uh, it, it's, it's uh, difficult to say, and I wouldn't say something that it's too low or too high. Probably uh, a couple thousands of dollars or euros, let's say up to $10,000 uh, should be suffice, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jon Petrova has a question in how Jon, can I address the question or do you want to address it a bit before? Yeah, you okay. In how, you ha in how much time uh, can you expect measurable results in dogs and humans? Well, with dogs, hopefully within 12 or 18 months, we will have uh, uh, some good perspectives on the product. Mm -hmm. I'm talking therapy time. From you the moment to time. initiate the therapy, in how much time you can measure some uh, some results, some positive results? How much time well, does it need to to pass until you can actually measure something? Yes, well, uh, on, on on cataract, this is a, this is a tricky question because uh, it depends. I will tell you more about it. Uh, so it depends on on the evolution of uh, of um, the disease. This could be enough in one year, but uh, we might not see a good result. For, for dogs, it should be enough one year. For humans, this is, this is a preventive therapy and the translation from drugs to humans, this is another aspect. However, what can I tell you is that lutein is frequently prescribed by the ophthalmologist for, uh, as a prophylactic tool for humans, but what, nobody says is that the efficiency and the bioavailability of lutein taken orally is very, very, very low. Therefore, uh, what we are proposing as solution will, will definitely help uh, practitioners like eye specialists in, in better assessing uh, the disease and the patients. Sorry, just to, have, just to make a small comment. Just to make a small comment. You can have curative uh, treatment and you can have, okay, improving the disease and you have the prevention. And uh, it's uh, many people might be interested to actually use it as a preventive to delay progress of disease, especially for people that fear uh, intervention. Just like a comment specifics, we can get into details later on. Yes, it has been Thank mentioned you. that this is a prophylactic and uh, stopping the progression or at least control yeah. it. I want to take the last question, hopefully short, from Mihai and uh, Georgiana. You will get time for uh, even a question. Thank you. Okay, I'll be short. Uh, thank you. So, um, my my question is: uh, Did you conduct any preclinical pre studies on uh, humans or dogs? And uh, if so, what were what was the outcome? Yes. Well, uh, I do have some slides here. Definitely, we have done a lot of preclinical studies. And we've worked, I don't know if this is still visible. Can you see the slide? It is visible. Somewhat, okay. somewhat visible. I... Somewhat, yeah. no, no, uh, the details are not important. What I wanted ah. to show you is that we've done uh, in vivo studies, preclinical studies on this cataract model. And we are currently uh, ongoing with the diabetic retinopathy. Um, and um, the results are seen for cataract here. So, uh, this is a, an impressive uh, result, as, as we call it. Uh, if, uh, if we see the, the control group, which has the, the more red the color is, the more advanced the cataract developed uh, has been observed. Whereas when, when our product was, was administered to these uh, red pops, then as you can see the number or the prevalence of of very low or no cataract uh, induction is significantly higher. So this was, uh, this was the incentive for us to continue and hopefully we will end up uh, with uh, the human therapy as well. Mm -hmm. And we also have toxicity, toxicity. Um... Yes. Uh, well, all, all, all the product ingredients are safe for use and lutein actually is a natural constituent of the eye. So we are confident that we will not have safety issues. And this is why it should be rather easy to register the product as a medical device. 
Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, I remind you that we have a uh, half an hour with each of the teams in the end, so you can go there and ask questions uh, and have a free discussion in smaller group in the breakout rooms. So now I'll uh, ask Ede to, to stop the share screen. Thanks for the presentation. It's really insightful. And now we move on to Levante with Robotics AI. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Can loading, you hear me? Yeah, yes, we do. Okay. Please, please, yeah. okay, so so Micha, thanks for the introduction. My name is Levante, and I will present shortly the robotics AI as a R&D spin-off company from Technical University of Cluj Napoca. So we are providing cutting-edge technology for market focus on autonomous robots in logistics, healthcare, smart building, and industrial automation as well. Uh, the problem that we are tackling, is a common problem for uh, industrial employee. Now think about this guy who is doing 50% of his working time carrying objects from A to B. That's kind of boring thing. Now, Let's shade light on the possibility of using autonomous robots instead of him just carrying objects all day. He would be happy and he would be appreciate this possibility uh, of uh, uh, using these AGVs in his everyday work. Now our focus is on solutions. We are providing solutions to gain time, to may have happy customers, and to lower the costs in everyday uh, running of uh, an industrial setup. And this is based on autonomous navigation solutions. We already proved our POC level demos in a number of emerging solutions, including AR, navigation, people action recognition, volumetric measurement, autonomous robots, road survey assistance, and many more. You can find all these demo videos on our website. Have you ever tried to navigate with a limited view, example, no light or fog? Well, the view or the perception via yeah, human eye gives a clear insight what is in the environment. And we provide this clear insight with our prototype for sensing via this advanced AI-based camera. We are already released the first units and we are working on custom solutions based on this smart camera. Our focus is on application-specific algorithms. We feel that we can have the most in the the object detection, volumetric measurement, human pose estimation, or visual inspection parts. Competitors from the market with similar products exist. However, we have a modular approach with openings towards robotic apps. And this is happening due to the custom solutions both on hardware and software parts. This uh, can be achieved with our strategic partners from industry and academia as well. From the industrial side, we have the board leading analog devices international, NVIDIA and the digital in integrator number one, Accenture. Beside this, we have the R&D facilities from Technical University of Cluj. Now shifting to the focus where you are interested in, well, the targeted revenue is through services. We provide services by age of integration, custom hardware and software perception solutions based on smart AI cameras. We provide these solutions with uh, approximate 40% margin and we get in touch with our clients through the broad range of distribution uh, channel of the ADI. Already we have sold thousands of units and we are estimating to have 
10,000 kilo units, uh, 10,000 units sad in the next year as well. This is happening with a core team from the Technical University and from analog devices as well. Levanta from the academia side uh, with the focus on the AI part and Andre with the industry side with a solid background in the hardware design. Plus there is an R&D team from the Robotics AI Lab from the Technical University of Cluj, including young PhD students and uh, master students as well. The traction on the market is due to the emerging field of the robotics domain as well. We have 20% annual increase in the aging market, and there are 7 million of uh, business in this market already today. Our objectives, or what we are looking for, is basically a potential B2B and B2C connections, IP securing, best practices, and visibility. Thank you for your attention, and let's meet for a coffee to discuss these advantages we provide, what, what we can provide on the market, and the direct benefits for the human users as well. Thank you again. Okay, so let's take two minutes for questions. One or two questions uh, from the panelists. Anyone who wants to be intervening or to find out details is welcome. So I, I have a question, uh, Mitya. Uh, so, yeah, so first, um, uh, what stops your industry partners to start producing? And uh, did you uh, uh, analyze the freedom to, to operate? So um, the industry partners, basically, they are producing this uh, tool. Now we are populating this tool with uh, solutions and we would like to sell these solutions to these devices. We have also some large clients, targeted some large clients. Uh, I can explain all the details in the session afterwards. Okay, thank you. Then one last question from Mihai. Um, hey, I, I, I wanted to ask you briefly what is your target customer? What does it look like? And what's your go-to-market strategy? So just tell us more about how do you actually get these products to the market? Yeah, um, basically this is related to the previous question. Our clients are, um, let's say, clients which work uh, in the logistics field. So they are interested in carrying objects from A to B. And they do, do want to do, uh, have this on an autonomous manner. And we can achieve the connection towards these clients via the distribution channel of the analog devices, which is pretty broad, including Amazon Robotics, Sony, uh, Hewlett Packard, and so on, big brands like that. Are they small, big companies? Where are they located? Um, do you, are you focused on anything? We have some uh, small scale clients, direct, connect direct connections as well, B2C, but they are, uh, this is in an ongoing negotiation phase. So this is happening now. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Levante, for the presentation and uh, questions. Uh, we're going to move on as we have. Uh, Next uh, presenter, Alina Sesserman, who will talk about her uh, anomalies applied in anti-cancer uh, situations. So uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present to you today our idea. Our idea is based on developing uh, therapy for cancer. We have chosen the melanoma skin cancer um, to develop a therapy which is based on liposomes that mimic extracellular vesicles. I will explain these terms uh, later. So the problem with this type of cancer is that the 
patients with stage one and stage two melanoma, they are treatable, treatable by uh, surgical removal of the tumors. But the uh, stage three and stage four uh, melanoma, um, these patients, they receive immunotherapy or some kind of uh, chemotherapy or targeted therapy, which, is, um, uh, which causes really severe side effects. And most of the patients, they do not respond to this therapy. So the percentage is below 23%. So uh, percentage. We are offering a solution, which is a disruptive solution for this type of cancer which is based on liposomes that mimic extracellular vesicles. So to explain these terms, imagine that in the tumors, the cells, they have to communicate in order to grow and they use words, but these words, they have to be transferred from one sense to another. And they are transported with some vehicles, which are lipids, lipid droplets, and they are called extracellular vesicles. What do we wanna do? We wanna purify these vesicles, we wanna see what molecules they have on uh, their surface. And we want to recreate in the laboratory this type of uh, vehicles. Why do we want to do this? We want to uh, entrap in these vesicles an anti-tumor agent, and we want to trick the tumor cells uh, to uptake these liposomes. And uh, because of the tum due to the tum tumor agent, they will be destroyed. So it's a Trojan horse approach for this type of cancer. We have the competitive advantage with our therapy to actively targeting the tumor. Uh, the side effects of the drug will be reduced. The tumor growth will be decelerated. And we have the advantage that this uh, kind of therapy, it will mimic the tools that the cancer cell used in order to communicate. Uh, we have targeted this kind of um, uh, uh, cancer because uh, globally each year two or three million people are diagnosed with skin cancer from which more than 100,000 they are diagnosed with skin melanoma and it's a growing market. Um, the investment in this type of treatment was last year around $3.5 billion and it's estimated to reach in uh, 2026 more than $7 billion. The market uh, is dominated by several uh, pharma companies like Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, which you can see these are the bigger, biggest producer of the vaccine that we, today we are receiving for prevention of SARS-CoV-2 infection. We see these companies are, as our potential partners, which will help us to move our technology from the technology readiness level of four, which we have achieved, to a uh, more higher technology readiness uh, level of six. We aim of uh, uh, reaching this type of uh, maturity. We, are, we have expertise in uh, uh, various fields such, such as uh, bionanotechnology, biochemistry, immunology. For years, we have produced this liposome that um, actively or passively target the melanoma. So we have the expertise. We have established strong collaboration with uh, universities from abroad or from our country, what do we need from you? We need a development partner, we need proper find funding to move our uh, liposomes, which will mimic extracellular vesicles to a higher uh, technology uh, level. The funding will be used to acquire um, uh, critical equipment, which we need at this stage to move forward our technology, to hire new research members in our team, especially an oncologist. And we also need to acquire laboratory reagents or to pay for analysis that we cannot perform and we have to externalize abroad. For the next four years, if we, found, if we find the uh, uh, proper uh, partner and funding opportunities, we want to prepare these liposomes to obtain a prototype of the liposomes that mimic extracellular vesicles. And we want to assist the development partner in moving this technology to a higher level, such as technology readiness level of nine. We cannot do this at the moment. So if you wanna fight cancer, if you wanna fight a different kind of war, part partner with us to destroy the cancer cells with their own weapons. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we take a question from Mihai and then from Georgia. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, no, I just wanted to ask you because you said you tested in laboratory, and I, I just wanted to understand a bit better what what um, tests what have you tested and, and what was the outcome. Thank you. So we are using in the laboratory uh, in vitro and in vivo models for cancer. We have tested liposomes and we have tested extracellular vesicles on. Uh, 
uh, tumor cell lines. We have melanoma cell lines, mice, mouse melanoma cell lines, and we also have tested the liposomes and the extracellular vesicles in mice. So we have a mo uh, subcutaneous model of melanoma established in our laboratory. For years, we test all the therapies that we develop in this kind of model. Thank you. Um, and, and also just uh, be aware that there is uh, there are programs like European Innovation Council Accelerator that you may want to, to look at for, uh, for further developing the product. If you're already you. at RL5, you can, uh, you can apply. Thank you very much for this information. Thank you. Georgiana? Uh, yeah, my question actually uh, relates to what Mihai just said. Uh, you said in the presentation that you are looking for funding. What kind of funding are we talking about? I mean, what, are your, what is your approach in terms of uh, gaining the funding for sustaining the project? So projects, um, um, uh, collaboration, uh, in order to acquire money, actually, to acquire this kind of uh, reagents, which are really expensive, in order to perform this omics analysis uh, to detect the proteins or the, on the extracellular vesicles. So we need money, actually and to acquire this pilot station because we wanted to produce the liposomes in our laboratory at the pilot station, uh, um, respecting these regulatory that they are needed for the liposomes. So the GMP, the GLP, and so on. So we need money. This is the, we target national projects, international projects, so any kind of support. Yeah. And have you, I'm sorry, just, just really quick in your chat, have you targeted such programs so far? Have you tried applying yeah. some? So at the national levels, each year, at each uh, second year, because these are the rules, uh, each year we have applied for project this year, I have applied um, for two Last year, I have applied for two projects, but they are too small uh, in order to allow us to acquire this equipment. So every member of the team, we apply, but they are too small. So the national projects, they are too small. And we, don't, we cannot find international partners who would be interested in investing. Well, we have some, some things to add, but maybe in the, in the uh, breakout rooms. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Alina. Thank you very much, also. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now we move on to the next team, which is uh, Zen, uh, Zen Reactors. Alina, please uh, stop the share screen. Uh, do you hear my voice, first of all? Yes, yes, Joel, we hear okay. you. Please do go on, share, and start. Okay, please confirm that you see my screen. It's loading now, it should be, yeah, we see it. Okay. So go ahead. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone. So my name is uh, Pap Jol from the University of Babes Boye University. So I am presenting our project ZenR, which is focused on obtaining potable water in an extremely uh, cheaper way. So first of all, uh, let me present the pr uh, problem uh, which are, we are focusing on. First of all, uh, we try to focus on regional problems, meaning that uh, in case of Romania, uh, despite being part of the European Union, has the lowest clean water access in the European uh, Union as well. So uh, the more uh, concerning issue is that uh, there is no evolution uh, in which concerns the ratio of potable water systems. So there is a big stagnation uh, in the coverage value, uh, in general speaking, in Romania. Uh, unfortunately, our neighbor like Hungary, they are advancing quite linearly uh, in, uh, the, uh, this, in, in this uh, problematic issue. And also in Bulgaria and other neighbors, the ratio of potable water access uh, is higher. So uh, we focused our problem, uh, we focused our uh, research and our project on uh, this issue. And also let me show a map uh, where uh, uh, it is monitored, the uh, excess, the probable excess uh, to drinking water. Like if you have seen the red color or you uh, with the red color you can see in the map, you see that uh, there is no excess or there is a potable water issue uh, which you can follow. In case of blue or other colored uh, uh, map slides, you can see that there is possibility to have access to drinking water. So there is uh, there are zones or there are areas in Romania which uh, necessarily are not covered uh, in 
uh, in uh, water systems. So how do we plan to solve this issue? Uh, it's in fact uh, by using a reactor, the Zen R reactor, which in fact uh, in, uh, involves zero energy impact, which means it's driven by sunlight and it's powered by nanotechnology, it removes uh, organic uh, organic pollutants, and the final products are CO2 and water. How this concept is working, in fact, it's relatively simple. We have a reactor which uh, has a solar cell, has a, um, has a sheet which contains a specific nanomaterial, uh, and uh, this is covered on, on the surface which can pour the amount of water which needs to be uh, cleaned. And of course, the energy to move the water is provided by the sun. And also, uh, the degradation of the organic pollutants is done by the nanoparticles, which are also excited and also uh, uh, activated by natural sunlight. So we can say that this, uh, in fact, is a zero energy uh, investment reactor. Uh, our team is composed, uh, this is the core team, in fact, uh, we are a little bit uh, bigger research group. So uh, we have at each uh, stage of development of the reactor specific experts uh, and uh, ourselves are chemists and physicists. So uh, we can focus on each of the reactors problems individually. Uh, by going further, uh, by investigating the market generally, uh, it is clear that drinking water is one of the main issues in the next few years, and also there will be the subject of war uh, in the next few years. And also the chemicals invested uh, in water purification processes uh, are getting a higher market uh, increasingly. Uh, the main advantage of our technology, of course, is that it doesn't use any kind of uh, uh, chemicals, we just use a specific nanoparticle and the sunlight. And of course, uh, this uh, increase uh, in the market will give us the opportunity to enter with our product. And in Romania, there is a totally niche market uh, concerning this system. So how is the roadmap of our technology? Uh, very simply, uh, roadmap. So uh, we have the laboratory prototype, which you have seen in the image. Uh, we want to further develop to have an ex situ testing uh, probability prototype, meaning that we can bring to local people to test them to evaluate uh, their performance. Then we want to further to manufacture a prototype which is in fact applicable and multiplicable for industrial production. We want to have a product from this later on. And of course, uh, in the longer term, we want to commercialize it. How do we want to achieve that? Uh, we have uh, short-term goals like finding key partners with the, which can help in investing uh, our technology. Then we should develop uh, together a short or long-term business plan uh, and later on uh, test those prototypes, start the production process, and later, off, uh, uh, later on, if the product works, then of course we can diversify the product depending on the water type or the area which needs to be applied. So uh, at the end of our presentation, of course, what we are looking for, we want to initialize cooperations uh, with industrial partners to have uh, the opportunity to further develop this project, to have a development uh, uh, to, towards the industrial area, to have partners in uh, projects uh, which have an industrial partner and the university partner to develop together the reactor. And of course, if there is any commercial partner which is interested to later on commercialize this product. So uh, have a glass of water, of course, and contact us regarding relating these issues. So thank you very much for your, for your uh, time and I'm expecting your questions. Okay, so I think we had the four questions. First question from Dan from early Game Ventures. Please, Dan. Simple question How much will cost a reactor? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. In fact, this is a very, uh, as uh, also uh, had this question at the first presentation. Uh, our prototype, uh, which is uh, carried out in the lab, it's around 200, 300 euros. So, because it doesn't have any let's say very expensive or specific equipment the only uh, only part of the reactor which needs more focus on and needs specialized equipment is the nanoparticles which need to be synthesized on that specific surface the other parts are really easily acquisitionable 
So that is why it, uh, we have a relatively low cost even for the laboratory prototype. Good, then it's affordable. This is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Georgiana, your question. Can you repeat the question because I or you write yes. it down because I don't hear it very well. Yes. So who is it going? Who is going to buy the final product? Is it going to be a household appliance or is it going to be uh, industrialized? Uh, the first one, and more, uh, because uh, in in the industry, if I got your question well, uh, the industry is dealing with more heavy type and more specified type of pollutants. While in case of household or drinking water access type of water purification, you have a more diluted type of organic material content and a more general one. When you have in case of industry buyers, then it's a little bit more uh, trickier because if it's applied to a specific industry as a water purification device, then you have to be very specific. Uh, in, in which means if you want to apply, let's say for a, for an industry which does, I don't know what kind of uh, what product and it has a, its own wastewater. I don't know if I got the question right. Kind of. My question was like, is it going to be bought by ah, yeah. okay. Luciana, uh, or is it going to be uh, commercialized, you know, to um, the big uh, companies like Apanova or whatever? That was the second question. one, the second one, the second one. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much all for presenting. Thank you very much. And, and we move on, please stop the share screen as we will move on to the next team. Uh, Kinga, you have the floor to present us uh, Lira Fred on lab. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I try. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hmm? No, yeah, so something sorry. is loading, the presentation is fine, so please do go ahead. Feel free to start, we see the screen. Okay. Um, I don't have, uh, op he uh, hello everyone again. I am uh, Kinga Henning from uh, Lirac Laboratory from Babesbury University. I am a researcher. And uh, I don't have uh, opportunity to invite you uh, at five o'clock tea, uh, which uh, was made uh, with water from Jolt. But uh, in, this, in uh, the next minutes, I want to tell uh, you uh, our uh, laboratory uh, story. First of all, I want to ask you if you are aware that you are being poisoned right now. Probably not, uh, but uh, you need to know that because more than 90% of our time we spend uh, indoor, in homes, kindergarten, schools, university, et cetera, workplaces, uh, and uh, an invisible danger hiding in our air, it's radon. Uh, take a look, uh, for example, at Romanian uh, radon measurement, uh, measurement map, uh, where you can see that we have a lot of regions where the radon level is over uh, the recommended uh, value. Uh, so why do uh, we consider radon a danger? Uh, radon is a radioactive gas uh, which causes uh, lung, lung cancer and uh, makes uh, a sick building syndrome worse, the newest health problem in the uh, 21st century. It's the second cause of lung cancer in the world. And why radon? Um, if we have uh, to compare radon to work, no, that causes uh, radon in more dangerous than. Uh, drunk driving or fall in the uh, home, uh, droning uh, or uh, uh, in the home, uh, home fire. 
an exposure at a level of uh, 300 becquerel per cubic meter uh, for the concentration of red on the ring on the building as effect on the health of uh, exposed person is equivalent to performing uh, 150 lung uh, X-ray per day to which uh, are, uh, are at the effects caused by smoking uh, 16 uh, cigarettes per day. So for smoker, uh, the risk is uh, more, uh, much time and higher. Our team uh, came uh, come uh, up with a series of solutions to help you protect uh, yours and uh, your family health. Our services. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, evaluation of blueprints and the screening, measuring step by step uh, the specific uh, need of uh, our services is screening services, uh, need to cover it knowing if you are exposed or not to radon. We have uh, detailed uh, services, diagnostic services, uh, being exposed to radon and uh, narrowing down uh, the main infiltration source and then try point of, uh, of the rooms in uh, the building. We have a remediation uh, system, which integrated ventilation system, reducing the radon ex exposure from high level of concentration um, to uh, the World Health Organization standards, meaning the post-remediation concentration are below 100 becquerel per uh, cubic meter. Uh, and we have uh, post-mitigation measurements. Uh, this is our services. The first step is the screening. If the radon concentration uh, has a high uh, value, it is a problem. And uh, it uh, was the second step to detail diagnostic, which is a one week uh, period to measurements. Uh, and the uh, finish uh, step uh, to perso uh, the personalized mitigation solution. How to uh, not let uh, radon to come in uh, your homes. We have also intelligent indoor air quality monitoring system, uh, which uh, measures seven indoor air quality parameters, radon, CO2, CO1, uh, uh, walk, temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, we have uh, also online monitoring platform, uh, which compatible with uh, smart house and uh, uh, offices. We have improved energy efficiency, and we have with uh, this uh, validation solution, we have award in smart health in 2019. What is uh, our business now? Uh, we have... Uh, a uh, lot of tested buildings. We have more than uh, uh, 500 happy clients. We have uh, utilized our services. Uh, our scientific expertise is outstanding and is uh, widely acknowledged. Our team is highly regarded in the radiation industry for their exceptional knowledge and research. We are unique, unique in Europe by offering radon screening to remediation services and uh, mitigation and uh, post-mitigation measurements. And we created the first red on map of uh, Romania. Uh, our uh, team is currently working with uh, uh, Romanian authorities, with Cenecan, and a lot of private associations like Romanian Green Building, uh, Asociația Română pentru Smart, City, Urban, Incerc, and uh, other uh, partners like Radon Control, Radosis, et etc. Uh, what is our vision? What we want to achieve as a team? We want to finish the Romanian radio map to improve our EK device to come up uh, with better market marketing and PR solution to expand our team and uh, to become an European radio leader also. Uh, the key ingredient uh, that I still uh, we still need in uh, order to achieve our dreams in uh, is founding. We need uh, maintaining and growing our team of experts in the radon field, um, acquiring new equipment for measurements and logistic, and investment in advising. Our market type is new at this moment in Romania. Uh, we are in the Blue Ocean uh, new market. 
uh, on the graphic, uh, you can see our, our business prediction over the next three years. Uh, the market size is constantly growing and we are trying to cover more and more uh, of it. Uh, we uh, have legislation in Romania for radon measurements in, uh, in the workplace, all, all the workplaces. It's uh, our amazing uh, team. Uh, we are physicists, uh, chemistry, engineering, uh, geographical uh, uh, team, and uh, geologist, specialist, uh, uh, and uh, many, many researcher. And um, I will uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, don't forget, measure radon to be safe and stay healthy and uh, have to balance uh, uh, about uh, radio, uh, house with radon and fixed uh, house uh, near radon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kinga. Let's hear questions from the panelists. Probably everyone is shocked that Transylvania is a risk region. <laughs> Georgiana having the first question, yes. Uh, yes. Over, uh, um, so can I address the question? Uh, Kinga, are you with us? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So um, you mentioned earlier that you are the, a unique provider of such services in Europe. So that makes me think that there are other providers of such different services. Um, well, what is your strong point? Just the fact that you gather, you offer these three uh, services together for the final consumer. And as I asked earlier, your final consumer is um, who exactly? Each individual household? Yes, uh, uh, the key of our best uh, uh, so, uh, team, because uh, we are the best team, uh, evidently, because we have the knowledge about 20 years uh, of uh, red measurements, and we have many research uh, results uh, behind uh, uh, our team. And uh, yes, uh, we have uh, clients, uh, individual persons, and uh, uh, institution, public institution also. Okay. I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, okay. okay. We, we can talk later okay. on. We can, we can uh, okay. Another question from Yon. Uh, which are the countries more advanced on measuring and implementing that on uh, risk reduction? This is in the chat. Uh, what is, I don't see the. Uh... Which are the countries more advanced on measuring and implementing red on risk reduction? Uh -huh. We have uh, such kind of countries in, uh, in Europe. We have uh, Spain, uh, Czech Republic, uh, also we have uh, England, Ireland. We have so, uh, sorry, uh, Bulgaria. I, so, uh, Alexandra, I don't think that uh, into the renovation program, all the country are uh, implementing now the Radon uh, measures. And uh, for the measuring, uh, for the measurement, uh, the, uh, for the first place in Europe, it's UK, United Kingdom, and then Czech Republic, France, uh, Austria, Germany, more or less all the Central and the West, West, West European country are uh, uh, progressing in Radon uh, program. East European, European country, we are in the, uh, I hope, in the first level, in the implementing this legislation at the national level. So we are, uh, thank you very much. And one last question from Dan. It's not a question. I just uh, want to notice uh, the extraordinary energy of Mrs. Kingo. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, so this being said, we move on to the last two presentations that we have for tonight. Uh, the first one is uh, Christina with the uh, Rethink.
uh, Rifi, yes, Karabu, you can Rifi. hear me. Yes, we do. Okay, and I hope you can see my slide as well. As well, yes. So you're ready to start. Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone. I'm going to present to you the Rethink Project, the therapeutic game that uses psychological science to help children find their superhero emotional strengths. So, one in five children suffer from mental illness, and uh, from those, uh, one in five receives actually treatment. Also, 50% of lifetime cases of mental illness begin by the age of 14. So we have a major problem regarding mental health in youth, especially when it comes to emotional disorders because they are most often undiagnosed. And also another problem is the low access to psychotherapy. So for the problem, the solution uh, has to be accessible, effective, attractive, and of course, preventive, because it's better to prevent than to treat an emotional and mental health issue. So we present to you our solution, the routine game, which is an online therapeutic game proven to be effective for preventing emotional problems in children and adolescents by building essential emotional skills that can be later translated into real life. The game is composed of seven levels. Each, levels, uh, each level trains a specific emotional ability uh, skill. And for example, identifying the emotions, relaxation, mindfulness, um, the difference between functional and dysfunctional um, cognitions, modifying them, problem solving, and com compassion. Our main advantage is that we have scientific validation in uh, implemented trials. We implemented several studies and the game has proven to be effective in prevention of emotional disorders in children, adolescents, and also in college students. Also, we have some projects in progress or in preparation for validating the in-game assessment scoring, also for extending it to vulnerable groups like children with chronic disease, uh, comparing to other street, uh, standard treatment and also to test the game in combination with parental intervention or other types of ecological mobile interventions. These studies are um, um, in collaboration with international partners, universities from Germany, South uh, Africa, Harvard University or a, a World Mental Health Organization. And uh, from implementing trials, we have already published papers with uh, uh, statistic significant results for the written game co when compared with uh, other types of uh, preventive uh, methods or uh, when compared to control group. And in, um, in current projects, we have over 1,700 children already enrolled. So what makes us unique is the fact that we are an evidence-based um, we have an evidence-based approach and intervention uh, that is already found to be effective. It can be used for assessment, prevention, and also for intervention. It is easily uh, scalable because it has uh, English storyline with multilingual subtitles, and it is unique on market. Our story uh, be began in uh, 2013 when we first received funding for the game, and we focused um, till now on the research area, and now we want to bring the game on the market. Uh, we have the freemium business model with trial and subscriptions, and we are trying to uh, um, make it a B2C for children, adolescents, parents, and adults, and later on B2B for mental health professionals, platforms, organizations, for different trainings of emotional skills by using this type of intervention, serious games. For, as timeline, we are now in the game refinement uh, implementation stage, and um, as well as for, uh, we are searching for potential commercial partnerships. Later on, we will need to select a commercial partner or find one. And of course, we want this summer to launch the game. Our team is uh, led by uh, Professor Juana David, which is the founder of the game and of the data lab. And we have a multidisciplinary team with psychologists, public health specialists and en engineers, and also commercial collaborators and international collaborators, uh, universities that I mentioned bef um, before. For funding, we are thinking we have two scenarios, one uh, for the current version of the game with minimal improvements and one for high innovation version with uh, all improvements. And we are looking for an ideal commercial collaborator with uh, which um, we want to be flexible to value input, to um, invest in developing and marketing the game, to be interested in tech-based mental health um, 
um, platforms or intervention for youths, for parents or for adults to be innovation driven and um, to work with uh, default developers or to re-implement the game in a different uh, game engine platform. So we want to invite you to join us in our mission and be part of the Routine Journey, the therapeutic game that uses psychological science to help children find their superhero emotional strengths. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And we can move on to the first question coming from Mihai Sfincescu. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> my question is uh, whether you want to to register this as a as a medical device or keep it as a as a say a, a psychotherapy aid, uh, which is uh, non uh, uh, you know non non licensed. Uh, for now, we are we are using it as um, a psychological intervention. But if we are we are extended it to chronic uh, patients, we can register also as a medical device. Thank you. Uh, okay. Marius and Razvan kind of have a similar question is who owns the intellectual property and the university if the university has any shares in the game company? So, so yeah, intellectual no, pro pro property is uh, Professor Wana David. Mm -hmm. And the last part of the question, sorry, was? The university has any shares in the game company? So we want to, uh, we have two options, either to have a potential collaborator where uh, who to take the game and develop further in collaboration with uh, our team or to develop a spin-off or startup for ourselves with the game to develop and to market the idea. Is there an inclination from one of the scenarios? Depending sure. on the um, ideal commercial, the, the partner we we uh, we found. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So thank you very much. And we move now to the last team, and uh, we're really on time. That's amazing. Uh, Silvio, uh, Silvio with VR Mind, uh, still in the psychology field. We're staying. So please start sharing the screen, and then. Uh, we can start presenting. So this being the last presentation, and then Christy will uh, wrap up on behalf of the RDA uh, agency, and afterwards uh, we'll be moving on to the breakout rooms after a short uh, break. So I think that I have a problem with my Zoom account to let me share, I'll just try once again. Let's see, after so many slides, uh, we're quite sure that it's not from our side problem. No, no, it's uh, uh, on my side. So um, I just have to take a, I just have to exit and re-enter Zoom. Sorry for that. I'm really sorry for that. No problem. If there are any other questions for uh, Rifin, we can still take one question in the meanwhile. Actually, I have a question if it's possible, because I've yeah. met them before. Uh, yeah, well, at good. least a spin-off. Uh, it was called Teens Up. It was, um, well, uh, your project was presented in Innovators for Children uh, project last year. Um, what I see right now um, is kind of the same presentation. My question would be, what have been the next steps from what happened last year? Uh, as the project was kind of in the same position, looking for a commercial partner, looking for a pricing strategy, what is the added value that you bring to the table right now? Uh, in order to gain a commercial partner, as you are saying. So from last year, we have implemented several studies and we have uh, these collaborators that uh, we have in preparation or in progress to some studies. Also, we refined the game and now we have an updated version of it. And uh, the fact that we have a multilingual, we will have at the end of the month, a multilingual subtitles, which means that uh, it is more um, easily scalable. So uh, our focus was on research and implementing the refining and implementing uh, and testing it on different populations. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing the solution is functional right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. So Silvio is back with his presentation. So let's hear about VR Mind. Okay, thank you very much for your patience and please excuse me for 
the no brain. Jump in. Yeah. Okay. So I will talk today about VR Mind, which is an um, innovative uh, mental health service, which is delivered using virtual reality therapy. My name is Silvia Mato. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Psychology and Psychotherapy at Babish Poe University. And uh, the product or the service that I will be presenting today is the work of a larger team that I will tell a little bit more about later. So um, what's the uh, what's the problem that we try to tackle? I start with challenging some of the of some of the ass common assumptions that people have about mental health that it's something like an exception. So those that need such services are rather an exception. Very few people. In reality, um, we have studies showing us that the vast majority of of, of the population will be confronted with some form of mental health disorder at some point in their life. So this percentage is quite uh, large. Uh, we have already some uh, psychological intervention that are effective for many disorders. So uh, um, we call it cognitive behavior therapy, but there are many other uh, uh, so-called talk therapy in which you go to a therapist and discuss about your problems. Now, these kind of approaches from a scientific point of view are less connected to the modern understanding of how our mind and our brain works. So our uh, product and our solution tries to um, use or, or to um, um, uh, put in the market uh, the, some scientific discoveries related to implicit cognitive processes that might actually uh, um, help us understand and treat mental disorders. Just to make it very simple, implicit means that I'm not aware of and I cannot talk about it. It's something that's more automatic. So this is what we target, those automatic processes that you're not uh, commonly uh, aware of them. Um, and what we need right now is basically a new way to approach the problem because what we have at the current time, um, this talk therapy, the talk therapy uh, solution, the standard model, doesn't seem to um, cover all the disorders or at least be effective with all the mental health problems that we are confronted and does not offer, um, we, it's not a very cost-effective system, meaning that we need to treat clinicians. Uh, it takes a lot of time and, and a lot of investment to, to, to prepare them. And also it's costly for from the, the other perspective of the client coming into the intervention and we need to improve that. Now, what's the market potential? Uh, we really try to understand where we stand right now with, with, this, uh, with this problem and with our solution, but it's uh, not so well doc documented. Even if you look in more developed countries, we're not so sure how many people are accessing these services, what's the need right there. What I can tell you right now that um, there is a certain a difference between the offer, which is much smaller than uh, the need. So up to 70% of the people that require mental health, mental health services do not receive them. We know there is a boom in technology-based services from, for mental health. Well, Christina, the, the uh, presentation before uh, tell you about one such avenue. Uh, I, this is another one, yeah. And uh, we would like to shift the, the, the market or we would like to focus on, on the market that is more interested in new interventions, uh, using technology or uh, focusing on new type of um, cognitive processes that could be challenged in order to improve mental health. This is where we are going. What is our product? We have a virtual reality application that uh, trans uh, translates the uh, user in a virtual environment like modern house, let's say, you can see it in the images. And inside this virtual environment, he is engaged in several kinds of mental exercises developed specifically to train those implicit processes that are relevant for anxiety, depression, and other kinds of problems. What could what those processes are? Mainly they are attention training. We try to uh, teach people to focus from negative information to more neutral or positive information. We try to teach them to, to remember more of the positive, neutral and neutral information rather than negative information. And also we have, we try to uh, make them interpret 
information that is ambiguous or unclear in a more positive or less menacing way as they are regularly doing in their everyday life. So for example, I would just give uh, one brief example. We have this uh, whiteboard where we have different kinds of words. Uh, people uh, running the application can use these words to make uh, a phrase that has a negative or a neutral or more positive meaning. We are specifically training them and encouraging them to, keep, to use these words to build uh, more positive or less menacing, menacing uh, 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 phrases or uh, to, 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 to use the words to build inf uh, phrases that are less menacing. In, and the idea is that doing this repeatedly on the long term, you will translate this kind of pro automatic process to your everyday life. Uh, what, are what are our competitors? There are several uh, on the market, but two are quite important and uh, global. They are delivering mental health services using virtual reality. But what we, how we are different from them, it's the fact that they are basically giving virtual reality to conduct classical type of intervention. For example, you use uh, virtual reality to conduct exposure, which, what, what regularly was done in, in, in let's say, a standard uh, psychological intervention. Now it's done with virtual reality. We also use this tool, but we don't uh, focus on something that you can do it in the classical intervention. We rather do something that it's innovative in the sense that uh, we are trying to to change those explicit process, implicit processes, sorry, that we know that are relevant for depression. And it's hard to change them to classical interventions. Okay? Um, how, what is our monetization uh, model? We would like to address clinics that offer mental health services and therapists. We would like to have one, to sell one lifetime individual license per, for each um, therapist or practitioner. It doesn't necessarily be, uh, it has to be one uh, particular, but the idea is that you have like one seat, which you can use for one client at a time. You can buy, of course, multiple seats if you want to like that. We offer the software and the training about how to use it. And the cost for a license for one seat, it's about 500 uh, euros. Uh, where are we now? So uh, there is a lot of research proving the technology, but it hasn't made its way into, let's say, um, common application that I'll deliver to clients. We have a fully functional product that still has, that needs some improvement before being put on uh, the market. And then I will speak a little bit uh, about that. Uh, this is our team. Our team is led by Professor uh, Daniel David. I'm uh, uh, one of the, um, of, the, of the team members that uh, worked in developing the product together with uh, the other colleagues that you see on the side. Uh, but we also have the support of the department and uh, the support of um, the, the tech transfer services inside the university. Uh, the investment that we are thinking about could go from 20,000 euro in, let's say, a smaller uh, investment plan up to 5,000 euro if we want to go, um, if we want to address a larger market. What we are looking this money for, what we do, do we need this money for? Uh, we would like to do a little bit, bit more extensive market research to lean on the need and to be sure that our pricing is uh, it's, uh, good. We need so, to do some polish uh, and uh, and debugging on the product to be sure that it works on any device uh, in uh, on any computer that uh, is using uh, the application. We would like to be able to offer some maintenance and support for the customer. So we will need to hire some uh, software developers to help us uh, do that. And we also, in let's say larger plan, we would like to do some improvements or update on the service to improve its functionalities. I really hope I wasn't too much over time and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Silvio. Let's hear two questions from our panelists, from guests. Going I have once. a question. Yeah, please. Um, have you tested the product so far? And if yes, what were the results? So we uh, are still doing the final, final process of testing it, meaning that um, we have a lot of data collected. We just need to wrap it up and perhaps publishing it. I said that there is already a lot of research on this, meaning that the technology, the idea, the concept behind that 
targeting those processes already received a lot of support. And what these studies tell us that we could use this kind of technology to combine it with classical intervention to, to, uh, for, for anxiety and depression. Okay, thank you. When, when will be ready the product? So in one if, month, in one year? So we can have it ready in, let's say, two to three months to be uh, ready available to any uh, clinic or uh, clinician that wants to use it. Uh, I think that uh, an advice here, please. Um, don't try to sell something from for lifetime. Okay. Try to do in little pieces in, I don't know, like a SAS kind mm -hmm. of sales, okay? Mm -hmm. And try to talk also with somebody who, know, who knows how to make sales. <laughs> Please. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the objectives of the event, somehow to connect the teams with people who are interested to help them with business and sales processes because they know their expertise and it's much harder to build the sales expertise with, uh, from scratch. So that's why better to partner with people or companies who have the distribution channels and knowledge in this sense. So, okay, so we ended up with all the teams. Thank you, Silvio, and thank you everyone for presenting. And uh, now we're going to have the closing words coming from Christy. And I just want to make an announcement about what's going to happen next. The Zoom stays open and we have prepared some breakout rooms. Uh, and in a couple of minutes uh, at uh, 6 p.m., uh, we'll take a break. Like after Christy's intervention, we take a break of two minutes. And then we come back uh, or you can stay still in here. And then you can join and the breakout rooms will become visible and you'll be able to join uh, any of the teams there will be the breakout rooms with the team names and you can join there have a free discussion with them in the first half an hour and then uh, probably there will be two three four five people of you however you feel like uh, and then depending on your interest and then we repeat that so you'll be able to talk with two teams at least and as well we can provide contacts if you drop us an email we can provide contacts to uh, uh, to, to the teams uh, as well and connect you by email as you prefer later on. And we do not disconnect, we stay here in this Zoom. Uh, so now, Christy, please, uh, for the final words on behalf of the agency, you have the yep. chance Thank you. to wrap up. Thank you, Mircha. So before the promised words from your side, uh, uh, let me do something that I uh, missed in the, in the last two years. So uh, congratulations to all the teams. Uh, uh, I wish that uh, we could have this meeting uh, live to, to offer the applauses uh, face to face. Uh, thank you to again to everyone that uh, sustained this process uh, for all the feedback, for the questions. And uh, let me tell you this, uh, since you were open to help us uh, until now, uh, I have to tell you that uh, you are also responsible from now on in uh, offering us the feedback, the, uh, the support in order to improve this, uh, this action, in order to find better ways of uh, sustaining um, researchers from the universities and not only. And uh, uh, I will uh, address one question that I saw from uh, Razvan Krachunescu. Uh, he was asking uh, if the university uh, or whom uh, are the parts that uh, will receive the, the funding. So uh, this is something that I need, uh, I, I feel the need uh, to clarify further on. Uh, it's, and it's related uh, on the general framework from our country uh, uh, in finding ways to create better scale ups uh, in supporting startups from the universities. So this is something that uh, we need to, uh, to find the solution and to address them at the regional level, at the local level, and even at the national level uh, in how can uh, teams as uh, the ones that we had today, how can these teams go in the market? Either uh, if it's from the umbrella of the university or uh, if uh, they are on their own, but uh, it's important to support them in either way and uh, to, to create this clear pathway uh, 
uh, and to create these alternatives and to, to communicate them in, in a quite efficient manner. So uh, thank you again. Uh, and please uh, be open to uh, join the breakout rooms as Mircha presented them and uh, to be on board uh, to, to our further round actions. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Uh, oftentimes what we see in the startup ecosystem is that we, if we have a couple of success cases, then others will follow soon. So it's important to push and uh, see a few projects like this uh, spinning off and working well, and then uh, the rest will follow. So that being said, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, it was uh, really good to have you here. And now we jump into the breakout rooms, which will appear in two minutes. So now you can take a stretching break. We've been sitting on chairs in the past two hours. Uh, so it can be a stretching break, a bio break, however you feel like, uh, uh, snacks break, and then